The Human Cost of an Illiterate Society by Jonathan Kozel. Precautions, read before using. Poison, contains sodium hydroxide, cause, sodalide. Corrosive, causes severe eye and skin damage, may cause blindness, harmful or fatal if swallowed. If swallowed, give large quantities of milk or water. Do not induce vomiting. Important, keep water out of can at all times to prevent contents from violently erupting. Warning on a can of Drano. Since I first immersed myself within this work, I have often had the following dream. I find that I am in a railroad station or large department store within a city that is utterly unknown to me and where I cannot understand the printed words. None of the signs or symbols is familiar. Everything looks strange, like mirror writing of some kind. Gradually, I understand I am in the Soviet Union. All the letters on the walls around me are Cyrillic. I look for my pocket dictionary, but I find that it has been mislaid. Where have I left it? Then I recall that I forgot to bring it with me when I packed my bags in Boston. I struggle to remember the name of my hotel. I try to ask somebody for directions. One person stops and looks at me in a peculiar way. I lose the nerve to ask. At last, I reach into my wallet for an ID card. The card is missing. Have I lost it? Then I remember that my card was confiscated for some reason, many years before. Around this point, I wake up in a panic. This panic is not so different from the misery that millions of adult illiterates experience each day within the course of their routine existence in the USA. Illiterates cannot read the menu in a restaurant. They cannot read the cost of items on the menu in the window of the restaurant before they enter. Illiterates cannot read the letters that their children bring home from their teachers. They cannot study school department circulars that tell them of the courses that their children must be taking if they hope to pass the SAT exams. They cannot help with their homework. They cannot write a letter to the teacher. They are afraid to visit in the classroom. They do not want to humiliate their child or themselves. Illiterates cannot read instructions on a bottle of prescription medicine. They cannot find out when a medicine is past the year of safe consumption. Nor can they read of allergenic risks, warnings to diabetics, or the potential sedative effect of certain kinds of non-prescription pills. They cannot observe preventative health care admonitions. They cannot read about the seven warning signs of cancer or the indications of blood sugar fluctuations or the risks of eating certain foods that aggravate the likelihood of cardiac arrest. Illiterates live, in more than literal ways, an uninsured existence. They cannot understand the written details on a health insurance form. They cannot read the waivers that they sign preceding surgical procedures. Several women I have known in Boston have entered a slum hospital with the intention of obtaining a tubal ligation and have emerged a few days later after having been subjected to a hysterectomy. Unaware of their rights, incognizant of jargon, intimidated by the unfamiliar air of fear and atmosphere of ether that so many of us find oppressive in the confines even of the most attractive and expensive medical facilities, they have signed their names to documents they could not read and which nobody in the hectic situation that prevails so often in those overcrowded hospitals that serve the urban poor had even bothered to explain. Even the roof above one's head, the gas or other fuel for heating that protects the residents of northern city slums against the threat of illness in the winter months become uncertain guarantees. Illiterates cannot read the lease that they must sign to live in an apartment which too often they cannot afford. They cannot manage check accounts and therefore seldom pay for anything by mail. Hours and entire days of difficult travel and the cost of bus or other public transit must be added to the real cost of whatever they consume lost of interest in the check accounts they do not have and could not manage if they did, must be regarded as another of the excess costs paid by the citizen who is excluded from the common instruments of commerce in a numerate society. I couldn't understand the bills, a woman in Washington, D.C. reports, and then I couldn't write the checks to pay them. We signed things we didn't know what they were. Illiterates cannot read the notices that they receive from welfare offices or from the IRS. They must depend on word-of-mouth instruction from the welfare worker, or from other persons whom they have good reason to mistrust. They do not know what rights they have, what deadlines and requirements they face, what options they might choose to exercise. They are half citizens. Their rights exist in print, but not in fact. Illiterates cannot look up numbers in a telephone directory. Even if they can find the names of friends, few possess the sorting skills to make use of the yellow pages. Categories are bewildering and trade names are beyond decoding capabilities for millions of non-readers. Even the emergency numbers listed on the first page of the phone book, ambulance, police, and fire, are too frequently beyond the recognition of non-readers.
Many illiterates cannot read the admonition on a pack of cigarettes. Neither the Surgeon General's warning nor its reproduction on the package can alert them to the risks. Although most people learn by word of mouth that smoking is related to a number of grave physical disorders, they do not get the chance to read the detailed stories which can document this danger with vividness that turns concern into determination to resist. They can see the handsome cowboy or the slim Virginia lady lighting up a filter cigarette. They cannot heed the words that tell them that this product is, not may be, dangerous to their health. 60 million men and women are condemned to be the unalerted high-risk candidates for cancer. Illiterates do not buy no-name products in the supermarkets. They must depend on photographs or the familiar logos that are printed on the packages of brand-name groceries. The poorest people, therefore, are denied the benefits of the least costly products. Illiterates depend almost entirely upon label recognition. Many labels, however, are not easy to distinguish. Dozens of different kinds of Campbell's soup appear identical to the non-reader. The purchaser, who cannot read and does not dare to ask for help out of fear of being stigmatized, a fear which is unfortunately realistic, frequently comes home with something which she never wanted and her family never tasted. Illiterates cannot read instructions on a pack of frozen food. Packages sometimes provide an illustration to explain the cooking preparations, but illustrations are of little help to someone who must boil water, drop the food within its plastic wrapper in the boiling water, wait for it to simmer, instantly remove. Even when labels are seemingly clear, they may be easily mistaken. A woman in Detroit brought home a gallon of Crisco for her children's dinner. She thought she had bought the chicken that was pictured on the label. She had enough Crisco now to last a year, but no money to go back and buy the food for dinner. Recipes provided on the packages of certain staples sometimes tempt a semi-literate person to prepare a meal her children have not tasted. The longing to vary the uniform and often starchy content of low-budget meals provided to the family that relies on food stamps commonly leads to ruinous results. Scarce funds have been wasted and the food must be thrown out. The same applies to distribution of food, surplus produce, and emergency conditions. Government inducements to poor people to explore the ways by which to make a tasty meal from tasteless noodles, surplus cheese, and powdered milk are useless to non-readers. Intended as benevolent advice, such recommendations mock reality and foster deeper feelings of resentment and of an inability to cope. Those, on the other hand, who cautiously refrain from innovative recipes in preparation of their children's meal must suffer the opprobrium of laziness, lack of imagination. Illiterates cannot travel freely. When they attempt to do so, they encounter risks that few of us can dream of. They cannot read traffic signs, and while they often learn to recognize and decipher symbols, they cannot manage street names which they haven't seen before. The same is true for bus and subway stops. While ingenuity can sometimes help a man or woman to discern directions from familiar landmarks, buildings, cemeteries, churches, and the like, most illiterates are virtually immobilized. They seldom wander past the streets and neighborhoods they know. Geographical paralysis becomes a bitter metaphor for their entire existence. They are immobilized in almost every sense we can imagine. They can't move up. They can't move out. They cannot see beyond. Illiterates may take an oral test for driver's permits in most sections of America. It is a questionable concession. Where will they go? How will they get there? How will they get home? Could it be that some of us might like it better if they stayed where they belong? Travel is only one of the many instances of circumscribed existence. Choice, in almost all its facets, is diminished in the life of an illiterate adult. Even the printed TV schedule, which provides most people with the luxury of pre-selection, does not belong within the arsenal of options in illiterate existence. One consequence is that the viewer watches only what appears at moments when he happens to have time to turn the switch. Another consequence, a lot more common, is that the TV set remains in operation night and day. Whatever the program offered at the hour when he walks into the room will be the nutriment that he accepts and swallows. Thus, to passivity is added frequency, indeed almost uninterrupted continuity. Freedom to select is no more possible here than in the choice of home or surgery or food. You don't choose, said one illiterate woman. You take your wishes from somebody else. Whether in perusal of a menu, selection of highways, purchase of groceries, or determination of affordable enjoyment, illiterate Americans must trust somebody else, a friend, a relative, a stranger on the street, a grocery clerk, a TV copywriter. 
All of our mail we get, it's hard for her to read. Setting down and writing a letter, she can't do it. Like if we get a bill, we take it over to my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law reads it. Billing agencies harass poor people for the payment of the bills for purchases that might have taken place six months before. Utility companies offer an agreement for a staggered payment schedule on a bill past due. You have to trust them, one man said. Precisely for this reason, you end up trusting no one and suspecting everyone of possible deceit. A submerged sense of distrust becomes the corollary to a constant need to trust. They are cheating me. I have been tricked. I do not know. Not knowing. This is a familiar theme. Not knowing the right word for the right thing at the right time is one form of subjugation. Not knowing the world that lies concealed behind those words is a more terrifying feeling. The longitude and latitude of one's existence are beyond all easy apprehension. Even the hard, cold stars within the firmament above one's head begin to mock the possibilities for self-location. Where am I? Where did I come from? Where will I go? I've lost a lot of jobs, one man explains. Today, even if you're a janitor still reading and writing, they leave a note saying, go to room so-and-so. You can't do it. You can't read it. You don't know. The hardest thing about it is that I've been places where I didn't know where I was. You don't know where you are. You're lost. Like I said, I have two kids. What do I do if one of my kids starts choking? I go running to the phone. I can't look up the hospital phone number. That's if we're at home. Out on the street, I can't read the sign. I get to a payphone. Okay, tell us where you are. We'll send an ambulance. I look at the street sign. Right there. I can't tell you what it says. I'd have to spell it out, letter for letter. By that time, one of my kids would be dead. These are the kinds of fears you go with every single day. Reading directions, I suffer with. I work with chemicals. That's scary to begin with. You sit down. They throw the menu in front of you. Where do you go from there? Nine times out of ten, you say, go ahead. Pick out something for the both of us. I've eaten some weird things, let me tell you. Menus, chemicals, a child choking while his mother searches for a word she does not know to find assistance that will come too late. Another mother speaks about the inability to help her kids to read. I can't read to them. Of course, that's leaving them out of something they should have. Oh, it matters. You believe it matters. I ordered all these books. The kids belong to a book club. Donnie wanted me to read a book to him. I told Donnie I can't read. He said, Mommy, you sit down. I'll read to you. I tried it on days reading from the pictures. Donnie looked at me. He said, Mommy, that's not right. He's only five. He knew I couldn't read. A landlord tells a woman that her lease allows him to evict her if her baby cries and causes inconvenience to her neighbors. The consequence of challenging his words conveys a danger which appears, unlikely as it seems, even more alarming than the danger of eviction. Once she admits that she can't read, in the desire to maneuver for the time in which to call a friend, she will have defined herself in terms of an explicit impotence that she cannot endure. Capitulation in this case is preferable to self-humiliation. Resisting the definition of oneself in terms of what one cannot do, what others take for granted, represents a need so great that other imperatives, even one so urgent as the need to keep one's home in winter's cold, evaporate and fall away in the face of fear. Even the loss of home and shelter in this case is not so terrifying as the loss of self. I come out of school. I was 16. They had their meetings. The directors meet. They said that I was wasting their school paper. I was wasting pencils. Another illiterate, looking back, believes she was not worthy of her teacher's time. She believes that it was wrong of her to take up space within the school. She believes that it was right to leave in order that somebody more deserving could receive her place. Children choke, their mother chokes another way, on more than chicken bones. People eat what others order, what others tell them, struggle not to see themselves as they believe the world perceives them. People eat what others tell them. A man in California speaks about his loss of identity, of self-location, definition. I stood at the bottom of a ramp. My car had broke down on the freeway. There was a phone. I asked for the police. They was nice. They said to tell me where I was. I looked up at the signs. There was one that I had seen before. I read it to them, one-way street. They thought it was a joke. I told them I couldn't read. There was other signs above the ramp. They told me to try. I looked around for somebody to help. All the cars was going by real fast. I couldn't make them understand that I was lost. The cop was nice. He told me, try once more. I did my best. I couldn't read. I only knew the sign above my head. The cop was trying to be nice. He knew that I was trapped. I can't send out a car to you if you can't tell me where you are. I felt afraid. 
I nearly cried. I'm 48 years old. I only said, I'm on a one-way street. Perhaps we might slow down a moment here and look at the realities described above. This is the nation that we live in. This is a society that most of us did not create, but which our president and other leaders have been willing to sustain by virtue of malign neglect. Do we possess the character and courage to address a problem which so many nations, poorer than our own, have found it natural to correct? The answers to these questions represent a reasonable test of our belief in the democracy to which we have been asked in public school to swear allegiance.